Working Cows Podcast, episode 254. This episode is brought to you by Kubota, celebrating 50 years of helping people get the job done right with versatile, durable equipment. Kubota, together we do more. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. And this episode is brought to you by Kubota. Ranching demands well-built equipment. Kubota equipment that's proven for over a century. Tractors that are adaptable and versatile. Hay tools backed by a two-year warranty. Sidekick utility vehicles where durability meets speed. And productive SSV skid steers. Visit your local Kubota dealer for a demo today. Very excited to be joined by Doug Ferguson today. Doug is, of course, a educator uh, in the realm of sell by marketing, and we're going to talk to him today about that, about how we manage uh, the different opportunities presented to us by swings and shifts in the market. And uh, also wanted to make you aware of an upcoming school that Doug will be teaching again in Deadwood, South Dakota, September 25th through the 27th of this year. So, I've uh, got about six weeks to get in on that, and I would guess it's going to fill up. So the sooner the better, September 25th through the 27th, Deadwood, South Dakota, the Lodge at Deadwood. As I've said before, great location, same place we hosted the uh, Young Farmers and Ranchers Convention uh, that South Dakota and Wyoming Farm Bureaus partnered together on last year. Um, another opportunity to come out in a beautiful time of the year to be there, probably get in on some of the fall color changes. Uh, Spearfish Canyon is among the most beautiful drives you will have if you've got some fall cover colors to look, look at, even if there aren't, it's a pretty drive. So opportunity there, and then, uh, come on out to, uh, one of the Connery ranches and check out, uh, some things that we've got going on there. So, uh, for a ranch tour at the end of the second day. So, uh, again, September 25th through the 27th. Deadwood, South Dakota. I uh, encourage you to come on out and join us for uh, Doug Ferguson's marketing school there. So we're going to talk to Doug today about uh, these marketing ideas and how we uh, take advantage of these opportunities that market shifts uh, present to us. So Doug, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back. Yeah, Clint, it's good to be back on. Enjoyed the last conversation. We talked a little bit about mindset and I guess uh, for this this one, I would kind of like to talk to you about where you think we are at. Where where do you see us being? Uh, I don't know if cattle cycle is a, a a term you're you're fond of or not, but in that you know kind of where do you see us at? Or is there is there a one size fits all as far as that whole thing fits together, or is it kind of really dependent on region and moisture and those things? Wow, you you just start with a loaded question this morning, Clay. <laughs> um, cattle cycles. When when I was taught to sell by marketing, I was taught to ignore cycles, and you know to just stick with the math. You know, sell by marketing's real time cash flow reckoning. So I mean, it tells us what the relationships look like right now. Right. The fact matter is that cycles do exist. They they are very real. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, there was we had a 120-day cycle, and every 120 days, the market drops. So somewhere on day 110, you know, I would sell the most overvalued set of calves that I had, and then I would wait, and sure enough, that market would drop, which gave me a lot of buyback power. So I guess my feeling is, is that cycles do exist, if you see them, take advantage of them. But the thing to always keep in mind is you've got to be ready because we've all made that bet on that, you know, sure thing <laughs> didn't happen. And when we look at cycles, we're kind of betting that history will repeat itself. Right. You know, that may not always be the case. Now, the thing I'm kind of keeping an eye on is there's a seven year cycle. 
that's kind of been taking place. And the last time we saw a market crash on a seven year cycle was 2015. So I'm going to get a little anxious. Are we going to see a really hard downturn this fall? Right. And with, with all the cows that we've been killing in this country, you know, there's, there's going to end up being a short supply of calves at some point, there's going to be a production lag as we rebuild. So even though we might see a, a dip and, and look, when I say a dip, I don't know if we're talking 3% or 30% drop in price here. I mean, it, 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 it we don't know yet. With the drought and the culling, there's going to have to be some kind of production lag, which I think would mean, you know, supply and demand is going to have to mean an increase in price for both breeding stock and calves. Now, with that being said, even though these swings are look like they're setting up to happen, everything is still based on price relationships between, you know, weights and types of feeders, condition, that kind of deal, and then, you know, age, condition, and type of breeding stock. Or have we been calling cows and killing cows because of uh, drought, or is, are there more factors than that? Is it is it kind of nationwide that we've been kind of reducing uh, the the nationwide cow herd? That's that's a good question, and I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. I look at a lot of our local sale barns, and I have no idea where these cows are coming from. <laughs> And and worse, you know, here we are. What was it? Last time I went to a local auction was middle part of July. And the sale barn owner sends me a text, tells me to be there about 1230, 1 o'clock. Well, 230 in the afternoon, they're still selling wet outs. And with all the rainfall we've had here, I have no idea where all these way cows are coming from. I don't know if they're getting trucked in from somewhere else and sold up here but man there's just been an awful awful lot of cows being sold and so i don't know if it's because of drought i don't know if there's other issues you know for a while there the way cow price was getting really really good um especially out in the western states we've seen some way cows out there you know selling around that dollar five mark and now it seems like with all the way cows coming to town we're starting to really back the price off on some of them. So what are the contributing factors and what magnitude and how many of these cows are going to actually end up going back to the country? I don't think anybody knows yet. Right. Well, and that's kind of the the purpose of the sell by marketing is to take all of those unknowns out. Right. I mean, to, to take all of the things we don't know out and just look at the relationships and say, what's overvalued, what's undervalued. Yep. Yeah. Those price relationships and, you know, it's it's just math. Right. And so I, I think I can understand discovering a uh, undervalued animal, but then how do I how do I tell if I've got an overvalued animal and how quickly and where do I market that and, and some of those things? You know, with the uh let's start with feeders. With with feeder cattle and even fats, you know, it's it's real easy to tell if you've got an overvalued animal. And, you know, the, uh, a quick analysis of a value of gain can do that. Running cattle squares can do that. And we can reduce it down simple enough, Clay, that a lot of times the animals that are overvalued are overvalued because those are the ones everybody's bidding on. So those deals are pretty easy to tell. Now, when we get into the breeding stock deal, you know, that's where sometimes the waters get a little bit more muddied. Because the breeding stock thing gets to be a lot more emotional to people. You know, we, we sure. really love our cows. And, you know, to go in and do that, I recommend doing it periodically. You know, maybe, you know, a couple of times a year. Sit down, calculate the intrinsic value of your cow herd. And then um, look at some local auctions that are taking place. You know, a lot of these sale barns will have that monthly breeding cow special. And that will then determine what the actual value of those animals is. And the actual value and the intrinsic value a lot of times are different. Now, what's been kind of neat for me and my perspective teaching these 
sell by cattle marketing schools is I try to keep everything as current and update and use real prices for every school. And last fall, well, let's let's go back to last July. When everybody was starting to think drought, and we saw a lot of fall calving cows, good young cows sell for way up price. Mm. And then by fall, everybody in Nebraska had corn stalks, and we saw the value of those females really go up. So if you bought them in July and have them, you you added a lot of value just by being able to get them into November. From November until March, everybody was very seriously thinking about some polling was even starting to take place here. We had a lot of dust blowing here just like everywhere else. And you actually saw the actual values of the breeding stock converged to match the intrinsic value of those cows. And then since that time here locally, Clay, we've had a lot of rain. And now we have seen the actual values of those cows start to skyrocket way above their intrinsic values, just because, you know, rain means grass. And the guys that sold cows early which I think they did the right thing, but now we've got all this grass and we don't have enough lawn mowers. And so now we're buying a lot of overvalued cows to go mow pasture. The value of gain issue is, are they worth, is the next pound I put on them worth more than it costs me to put on? Is that, is that a good understanding of it? Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of people get confused. You know, I write that uh, market Intel blog on beef magazine website every Friday. I mentioned the value gain. Now, when I talk about value gain, I'm not talking about doing actual trades yet. It, it's just what you alluded to. Is it going to pay me to feed the weight on? And so let's say just, just for easy figures, Clay, let's say the value of gain is a dollar twenty-five and your cost of gain is a dollar. Well, yeah, it's absolutely paying you to put the weight on. But there's been this, what I, I kind of refer to it as a price cliff, and it's kind of been bouncing around somewhere between 700, 900 pounds on these feeder cattle. And, and, and here lately, it's been a little closer to that eight, 900 pound mark. But all of a sudden, the value of gain is, you know, somewhere between 40 and maybe 80 cents. And if your cost of gain is a dollar, what we're end up doing is it's it's costing us more to put that weight on. And so if we feed that weight on that animal and then sell it, what we basically just did was subsidize the buyer. Right. And we're we're not capturing the full value of our feed. So the value of gain then is it my animal is overvalued if I won't be paid to put the next pound on them? Is that a is that a good idea? Well, that's where you're starting to take them from being an overvalued animal into an undervalued animal. So like if you, uh, you know, 10 weights have been a really poor sell up until here recently. So let's just, let's just go back a month and say 10 weights. And so let's, let's say the value game was 40 cents and you take them over that price cliff and you sold them 10 weight cattle, you devalued your feed and, and now you have, since that value gain wasn't very high, you have an undervalued animal. You, you took it over that price cliff. And so your what happens then is your cost of gain is going to be higher. When we get into doing cattle squares, your, your cost of gain is going to be higher than your return on the gain. And the return on the gain is the ratio of dollars to pounds. What am I getting paid for those pounds? So, the reason I talk a lot about value of gain is it is a very quick analysis. You can look at it and say, hey, there's this high value gain here. I'm capturing this, but there's this price cliff out here on the horizon. Maybe I better do something before I get to that point. Right. Does that make sense, Clay? Yeah. Is the is the most common mistake holding on too long, would you say? Or maybe the more common mistake is not buying low enough? Uh, what would you say are some of the common mistakes you see people making? Well, before we learn sell-by marketing, I think the most common mistake is to let scales and calendars 
dictate when and how we market cattle. And, mm-hmm. and really, if, if we let scales and calendars dictate, all we're doing is we're trying to deflect responsibility. You know, well, it ain't my fault. You know, the cattle market was down. We always sell in November, you know, like dealer, you know, yep. we always sell eight weights. And all of a sudden, maybe eight weights are really undervalued. Well, it ain't my fault. Them cattle buyers didn't appreciate, you know, the condition of the stock. You see, you see that gives us that ability to flex responsibility. Hmm. Um, and when you say, you're saying scales with a C, right? Not sales as in they've got a, They've got a year right. special yeah. coming up. Scales. Yeah. Like, yeah. like trying, trying to hit a target weight. Right. Like some people will sell cattle once they weigh 800 pounds. And then I would say maybe sometimes after somebody learns sell by marketing, you know, they, they have a hard time letting go of some of those old paradigms. And, and, you know, I was guilty of this. The very first group of cattle I bought after going to sell by school, you know, I had a really good set of cattle. They were they they had just an outstanding, awesome average daily gain. And I thought, man, I need to hang on to these, keep feeding them, you know, really capitalize on the on the average daily gain these cattle are doing because it's helping drive my cost of gain down. And I held on to them too long, took them over that price cliff, and I ended up selling a really undervalued set of cattle. And that's the thing about going from a conventional buy sell paradigm into sell by marketing is we have to let go of some of those ideas. Sometimes people kind of like, well, you know, you're, 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 I gave all that good away. If if I would sell those cattle and they're, and they're really gaining good, I gave all that good away. No, I didn't. If I sold an overvalued set of cattle, I sold the buyer what he wants. Mm. And then I'm going to go buy something that, that other buyers don't want. And, and that's, that's why sell by marketing works. These, these price relationships always exist. And we just have to be paying attention to what those relationships are at the time, know what we have in inventory, have a really good idea what our cost is. You know, and, and here's the thing about cost. This is why cost is so important. When we run a cattle square or a value of gain, we got to know what our cost is so we can make an accurate comparison. So I always refer to the cost structure is it's it's that fulcrum. Like if you imagine a lever, it's the fulcrum. It's that pivot point. It gives you your leverage when you when when you try to use a lever. So you have to know what your cost is to know where that pivot point is. Yep. And you know, some people get a little bit intimidated by this play. Like I said, okay, you need to sit down and figure the intrinsic value of your cows and look at the markets and see what they're selling for. And you need to know your costs. So that means you're sitting down running your calculator and you need to pay attention to what different weights cattle are selling for. It doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you can you you should probably know what your costs are anyway, you know, even if you just do it at the end of the month. Um and really all you got to do is pull up your local market report from local sale barn or something. And you can look at those prices, do it once a week, take a few minutes. And, and that's looking at all the different weights and, and looking at the relationships between those weights and finding out, you know, where's that price cliff? What's the overvalued animal here? What's the undervalued animal here? And the undervalued, and that's kind of where I was going to go with my next question is zoom way out and say, well, what's the, just describe to me the para- paradigm of sell-buy and describe to me the paradigm of buy-sell. And that's kind of where it lies is we're looking to find those undervalued animals, capture them, and then sell any overvalued animals we have. But could you maybe put it in in your own terms as far as the, the describe those two paradigms to me, sure. kind of just well, to contrast them? Both paradigms. And, and this is what I don't like about words sometimes is words get hijacked by another group of people. You know, the words overvalued, undervalued were a lot of times just used in the sell by circles, people that, that knew and understood it. Now everybody talks about undervalued cattle. Yep. It's <laughs> the same thing with maternal. Everything is maternal now. Right. Even though so nothing is really maternal. That, that list of words just goes on and on. <laughs> 
here's the thing between the buy sell and the sell buy. Buy sell, you buy something and you're hoping to buy it low. You're going to own it for a period of time. You're going to put some money into it, and then you're hoping that you're going to sell it for more than you have in it. And it's probably all of that is probably determined by a calendar, right? I bought this at at this sale where they were selling feeder cattle, they, and, yeah, and gonna I'm going to have calendars and guys look at the board and sure. Oh, and I can get these cattle. I, I, if I buy this weight. And, and they gain this, I can get them out in April. And, you know, they, they, they're figuring all that stuff in there. And it, to me, it's like, you know, that you're, you're trying to manage a lot of moving parts that you have absolutely no control over. You know, in order for a lot of that to work, a lot of times you would have had to predict something like COVID <laughs> It's going to limit the capacity at packing plants. We're not going to guess anything with that kind of accuracy. And this is what I like about sell buy because it is a real time cash flow reckoning. We look at those relationships right now because that's all we know is, is today. We remember the past, we live in the present, and the future is unknown. So with sell by, we're looking at right now. We know our cost. We we got a pretty good idea what our cattle weigh. We got a pretty good idea what they're worth, and then we can make that comparison. Hey, I can sell this kind of cattle I got at home, and I can go to an auction or I can get on a video sale and I can buy these for this price. And you you kind of run your numbers and you're like, yep, I can make fifty seventy five dollars a head on that trade. Yep. So that leads me to my next question. Uh, can this be done successfully at a small scale or, or could you, would you take a stab at the smallest scale you can imagine this working well? Um, the smallest scale working well would be one head. <laughs> no, and I'm saying, I know that, I know that sounds kind of funny, but you know, that's the thing about sell by marketing. It's, it's, it's a sell one, replace one. You know, it's, it's a it's a head per head deal. And, you know, a lot of times, and, and I realize I'm guilty of this, and it kind of really throws people off, but a lot of times I talk about doing loads. And you don't have to do loads. The reason I, a lot of times I mention loads is I know the market that I'm selling into and the guys that I sell cattle really like load lots. That's that's what hits them. That's their model. That's what they like. So that's what I deliver them. Now, I also do a lot of gooseneck type deals. And I've made good money just, you know, 15, 20 head on a gooseneck trailer. Um, I've had, when I started, the first group of cattle I ever put together was 17 head. You know, 17, 18 head, something like that. I've had people go through the marketing school that have had you know, less than a dozen. Yeah. Yep. No, I, I appreciate that because we would be looking at doing it on a small scale here and it's something that we've kicked around before. And, and I know, um, you know, maybe this is another question, but I, I don't know if this was the case for Bud, but I think I heard Wally say that his wife was the one doing most of the buy-in over the years. Is that how you understand that? Yeah. 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 Wally's wife sat in the sale barn. I think if I'm if, if I'm thinking the same story, she was always worried about the the freight. If she buys one and, and Wally came came up that deal that you know the freight goes all the freight goes on that first one, then you ain't gotta worry about it because you bought one, now you gotta haul it home. Right. <laughs> sure. But you know, that's the thing. I, I buy a lot of singles. I buy a lot of singles and small groups and I piece them together and then I make some good money resorting. So, I mean, you know, to do what I do, there, there is a little bit of economy of scale. Right. You know, and, and it's taken me years to get from that first little group of 18 head, you know, to where I am now. And one thing I've learned, Clay, is there, there are certain advantages to being small. There are certain advantages to being bigger and both of them have their own sets of headaches that come with each you know and and so i don't really get hung up on the size deal it's it's more of a matter of how well are you managing your inventory and 
doing a good job of marketing and all and, and those kinds of things. We got a marketing school coming up, or you have a marketing school coming up in in Deadwood, South Dakota, uh, September twenty fifth. That's a Sunday night. Is the the social through uh, the twenty seventh, which would be a Tuesday. Uh, kind of talk us through a little bit about the plans that you've got for that. Sure. Um, so you mentioned there's going to be like a little social. Uh, I I don't have all the details on that. Yet my wife sets all that up. But uh, basically what we do is, you know, a lot of times people travel in for to get distance to these marketing schools and, you know, okay, well, you, you got to get there a day early because, you know, you got an 18 hour drive or something. What do you do? So we've had some of these little meet and greets, these little socials, and, you know, it, it really helps the people in the class do some networking, get to know each other. And I think the biggest advantage is it gets rid of the nervous energy. You know, if you walk into a class on, on day one, eight o'clock in the morning, and I don't know any of these people, and I don't know this guy teaching this class, people come in nervous. So that's the neat thing about the social. It gets rid of the nervous energy. We kind of sit around and tell some stories. You know, it's a fun deal. We have some food. You know, it's a good time. Then, on, uh, then we go into a two-day marketing school. And I always, and, and, and play, I, I really get a kick out of this. I start every school with what I call the psychology lesson. <laughs> and, you know, I remember there was one school we did here earlier this spring and this cowboy sitting there, you know, he's got his arms folded across his chest. And, and I get to talking a little bit about emotions and feelings and, and that kind of deal. And this guy's like, I'm not going to talk about my feelings. I looked at him, I says, that's great. Cause nobody really cares to hear it. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm kind of a crusty old bastard myself and, and I'm serious. I don't want to hear it, but I talk about that stuff because we need to be aware of what's going on in our own minds and how our thoughts and our feelings and those emotions affect our business. And when I introduce a new idea, which is sell by marketing to some of these people, you start to have these conflicts in your mind. So that's why I go through this whole deal, what I call an X, Y paradigm, X being the existing paradigm, Y being the new idea. Mm. You're going to have some mental conflicts. And so I'm preparing you for that. And, you know, just like in that previous inter interview, you and I did, I'm really big on this training your brain to win thing. And that's all included right at the very start of my school. And, you know, we go through a couple hours of that and then we get into managing inventory, you know, the, the inventory triangle of feed money and cattle. And, and, you know, I've added time into that because time is a huge, huge factor. You know, it, it takes time for a cow to go through the gestation period and replicate herself. It takes time for an undervalued animal to become overvalued. And, you know, if and the other thing with the inventory is if we do a good job managing our inventory, we get to bring more stuff into our inventory. And, you know, I, I kind of touch a little bit on the parable of the talents. You know, the, the servant that got punished was the one that buried his and held on to it. The ones that got rewarded were the ones that went and traded and expanded it. Right. And, uh, you know, that's that kind of, and I'll, I'll touch on this just real quick since I'm thinking about it, but sometimes people worried about doing sell by marketing and doing these trades, they'll get branded as a cattle trader. <laughs> now, when I talk about doing trades, and, and it's probably the not the appropriate word to use, but it was the word that, that seems to fit and we all use it. But I'm not talking about just running swapper cattle where you buy something in this sale barn on Monday and you sell them in this one on Thursday. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm talking about running a legit program. Let's let's put a little weight on, a little vaccination program, clean up some physical blemishes, you know, do some sorting, you know, put some feet in them, capture some value again, those kind of things. I'm, you know, I'm talking about running a legit program. And, uh, you know, we get into... Uh, I, I kind of break the inventory triangle down. We'll talk about feed. And I've done something different this year 
and people really seem to like it, but I take a little time and we slow down and I actually talk about money. And, Mm. you know, I'm also a big believer that there's these seven fundamental laws of the universe and sell by marketing works because it is in perfect harmony with those seven fundamental laws. And one that we're all very, very familiar with is cause and effect. Money is an effect and it will absolutely refuse to replace you as the cause. So if we want to have a profitable business, if we want to make some money running these cattle, we have to work on the cause, which means we have to work on ourselves. And so we cover all, all this stuff in the first day for the marketing school. Now, the second day, it gets to be a lot of fun because that's when we get into the math. That's when we start talking about value of gains. That's when we do the cattle square and we start calculate, calculating the efficient market value of cattle, which is the maximum amount that you can pay for an animal and still hit your profit target. And then I finish that second day going into cows and determining intrinsic value and comparing intrinsic values and actual values and comparing different classes and types of cows to each other. And I will forewarn you, Clay, and anybody else, I am I am not a data puncher, so I'm not going to sit here and give you black and white numbers. And this is this is on the cow thing. On on the feeder cattle, everything is pretty black and white. But on the cow thing, I'm going to bring it back to training your brain to win, and I'm going to make you think a little bit. I'm going to I do this intentionally. I will put some trades in there. And so an example from the July school that we just wrapped up, I had a I had an example in there where you could sell this pair. And buy this other pair for half price. And then I tell you about that pair. You know, these were 900 pound cows. They're really, really thin. You know, can you tell the difference between a spent cow and a thin cow? Does this cow have yonis and yada, yada, yada? Well, here's the other thing. These pairs that we're looking at buying had really big calves. Sick cows don't raise big, fleshy, healthy calves. And, and, and there were more details to go along with those pairs, but that gives you some examples. We spent 20 minutes on that slide just discussing that deal. And it it could have the potential to be a sell one pair, buy two pairs type trade. So do you have enough feed to bring in twice as many? Do you have, if you spend your whole paycheck from that one pair to buy two pairs, do you have enough money and inventory to stay current with your bills and keep your business afloat? That's a lot to think about. Real world situation, that auctioneer is looking at you going, Clay, are you in or are you out? He <laughs> time for you to sit there and analyze all that. And so I, I, I do some of that stuff in the school to make it a little bit more real world. And now you've gone through this exercise. So hopefully when you go home, you go to your local auction, you're you're prepared for these kind of scenarios. Yep. And so uh, kind of walk me through the schedule each day. Is it kind of eight in the morning to early evening or uh, late yeah, afternoon? We, we, uh, we try to go eight to five. And um, I will be honest, a lot of times I will go a little bit past five o'clock. Um, you know, a lot of my schools, I think the smallest one I've done this year had 35 people in the room. And, you know, you start getting 40, 50 people in a room and then you have a question, which leads to another question and there's some discussion. And I really like that. So I kind of let that go for a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, people are there to learn and and to think. And, and, and you know, so I don't stifle that maybe as much as I should. So sometimes we'll go a little bit past five. But I, I try to do my best to really wrap them schools up around five in the afternoon. Sure. And then we're talking about doing a tour uh, at my family's place. And so it's going to be, uh, so just tell you a little bit about this tour. It's been, it's been irrigated hay ground for a long time. And my dad put in a pivot last year and he's in the process of, of switching it over to, uh, irrigated pasture and a grazing, a grazing kind of a deal. So I think it'll be pretty interesting to look at. And then there's an, another stop on the way by that we, we might make a stop on the way by to um, schedule permitting. So another place that we could stop and look at, that's got a lot of just neat black Hills history. That's been a family ranch for a few generations. And so we'll, we'll see uh, how that all fits together, but for sure that, that converted 
hay ground into into a uh, grazing irrigated grazing kind of a deal is is where we're for sure pointing our compass and that's that's family land so i think that'll be a good time yeah that'll be awesome and I, you know that's um just to kind of give a little different perspective you know i get to talk to people from all over the united states and everybody's situations are so different and Right there, just my knee-jerk reaction here, and you talk about irrigated pasture. Is that common in South Dakota? No. <laughs> no, it is not. I was, you, you caught me really off guard with that. So that would be, that's, I mean, that's going to be really unique. That's going to be something really neat. Yeah. Yep. So I'm excited about it. Is this, is this business model something that you would attempt without a feedlot or without a good relationship with a oh, feedlot? Absolutely. Cause right there, I was just thinking like you mentioned your dad and staying involved in irrigated pasture. I mean, sell by deal, you know, gives the, look, we, we capture our profit on the buy. And so we have absolute total control of that. You know, if, if the price of cattle gets too high, we quit bidding. So we're right there about irrigated pasture and that kind of deal. We can make darn sure we capture the full value of that grass. You had a great uh, episode on on Jared Lumen's podcast. You and Wally did a Q&A. And one of the things that I found uh, most helpful from that was that 10% rule about uh, if you got 10% or if you've got so much to spend, you go spend 10% each week. Uh, kind of just, I mean, I've kind of given it away, but explain that or talk a little bit about that strategy and, and how sure. that might well, play out uh, in this scenario of a, an irrigated pasture. Yeah, that's, um, I got to give Wally full credit for that. That's, that's an idea that, you know, I've seen him share in his schools and he shared with me and, you know, I do use that at the conclusion of my schools. I have some of these little rules of thumbs, something to think about when you go home. And so like in that example that I use just for easy numbers, if you had a hundred thousand dollars that you're going to invest in buying cattle, some people get pretty intimidated by just walking in the sale barn and spending that kind of money. So Wally's idea is you go in with $10,000 the first week and buy some cattle. Now, you know, in all honesty, a hundred thousand ain't going to buy you very much. And I realize that 10,000 really ain't going to buy you a whole lot. But you spend that first ten thousand, and you 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 try to do the best job you can buying undervalued calves that week, and then go back the next week, spend another ten thousand. Go back the next week, spend another ten thousand. By the time you get to spending that last ten thousand, some of those cattle you bought that first week or two will probably start to become overvalued, and so then you can sell them. And start doing some sell by trades while you're finishing up investing the last of your hundred thousand. And you know, I share that in schools and with people that are new to it, people that are young, they're they're just beginning. They that that idea really offers a lot of comfort to them. It's not like I gotta go in there and just pull the trigger one shot, you know, because people are really worried they're gonna mess it up. And, and that idea kind of seems to be like a security blanket for a lot of folks. Yeah, no, I really thought that was a helpful, a helpful insight. And uh, yeah, so are there good undervalued animals and bad undervalued animals? <laughs> well, I think probably the only the only ones that I would consider to be bad animals are those ones that you just absolutely know are going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. There's how would I explain it? You know, a buyer with some experience can kind of can kind of relate to this. If you're a rookie, you're probably not going to understand it. But there's a point where you gain some experience buying animals, and you develop this eye, and you have this intuition, and you can look at an animal and say, "Nope, this one has already been tried. It's stale. I know this critter isn't going to do anything." Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the other ones that, you know, you can look at them and say, yep, I, I can work with this. I can do something here. And I remember a couple years ago, a lot of the local buyers really started making fun of me because I jumped right in the bottom of the barrel and started buying a lot of what a lot of people call junk cattle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time, Clay, COVID had everything shut down. 
I'm not going to my daughter's basketball games because there is no basketball. We're not, <laughs> gonna, you know, they're just, everything was just canceled, shut down. We ain't doing nothing but staying home. So, you know, I could stay home and, well, I was forced to stay home, but I, but I was here to work with those animals, give them they need. I had all the time in the world to, to address anything going on with those animals as far as anything cosmetic or health-wise or anything. We had all summer, I kicked them out on grass and there again, that's where that time thing comes in. And, and they ran out on grass all summer. They bloomed up really nice, brought them back, sold them in the fall. Boy, nobody was making fun of me then. <laughs> You know, I sold them for more dollars per pound than what I, or, you know, wow. price per pound than, than what I paid for them. So I advanced those cattle. So I, I don't know, I probably got a little off topic on that. No, that's perfect. No, that's what I was asking. You've got, if you've got the time to invest in but them and the feed resource to, to put them out, you know, you, um, you can. You have to buy cattle that you can handle. And, you know, if you don't understand some of this stockmanship stuff and, and, you know, if you don't understand some of these animal health things, you, you can get yourself in a real bind. You know, if you buy the wrong animals and you don't know how to handle them, you can get yourself in a real bind. And, and I'll just kind of touch on this real quick, Clay. Sometimes I hear cow calf guys, you know, I'm not making any money. I should switch and get into the stocker deal like what you're doing. That's fine. But understand if, if you've never dealt with stalkers and all you've had is home raised cattle your whole life, you're going to get a very rude, quick awakening in the <laughs> animal health or immunity and those kind of things. Right. Right. And, and that's kind of one of the other questions I've got is mentorship, uh, mentorship on the buying side, mentorship on the selling side, mentorship on the animal health side is a vet a veterinarian a good place to go as far as hey what do i do with the, this pen of cattle you know what are some best practices you know where would you go if you were looking for some uh some places to learn about uh those different aspects of this business model that's a good question clay i learned a lot of that stuff by what i call paying tuition <laughs> you know i I made the mistakes and I had to pay the price for it and that gets your attention. And you tend to learn a lot faster that way. And, and, and the lessons really sink in. Um, I'm not trying to pick on a lot on veterinarians, but well, I'd say there's a lot of things veterinarians just don't learn in vet school and they don't understand. Um, now one guy that I think is really good. You've had on your show is Tom Nofsinger. Mm. I mean, you know, he, he understands the stockmanship side and, and, you know, if you ever get to go to one of his seminars and hear him speak, you know, he can bring the stockmanship side and the science side of the veterinary medicine. And he does a really good job of marrying those two things together. You can really learn a lot from him in an afternoon, but, um, man, otherwise, you know, you got to talk to people, yeah. talk to people that are doing some of those things and, you know, part of part of that is is tough play. You you kind of got to earn your way in, right? You know, but it's just like anything. You got to earn your way in. If you walk into a sale barn and you sit down next to me or anybody else and you start want to start asking questions, we're <laughs> you're gonna we're gonna look at you a little suspicious and, and not want to talk to you, right? But, uh, you know, you kind of earn your way in a little bit, and, and and we all do this. I do this with local buyers. I do it with buyers in other places. You know, hey, what are you seeing? How's the health on the cow you've been buying? We start discussing. Hey, you know, I've had these issues. I've tried this drug. Are you seeing this? You know, and then we start comparing. What drug are we seeing a response with? If we got a doctor sit cattle, or you know, we we start discussing vaccination programs and those kind of things. That's turning your way into that network. Right. My dad's got a good friend who's, uh, you know, been in the ranching industry since he was out of high school, I think. And he's probably in his 60s now or, or real near it anyways. <clears throat> and he uh, he's famous for saying uh, the learning curve continues to be straight up. So um, we're, none of us has got this totally wired and we're going to need people around us to help us out and and there's there's going to be people who've had experiences you haven't had and so just even if you don't think anybody around the table knows the answer asking the question around the table it might the answer might be there even if you don't think it is and this is 
you know, this is a little bit off the marketing topic. It's more of a stockmanship deal, but every group of cattle you buy is different. There, there is no cookie cutter recipe on handling any of these animals. You've got to read them and they, and, and, and if they trust you, they will tell you what they need. Well, Doug, I'm, I'm never trying to exhaust a topic and I always want to be uh, respectful of my guests time and actually if in a guy in your situation what i'm trying to do is is create some thirst to 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 check you out and and come come to one of your schools or you know get in on your your uh your market blog and and some of those things so um i guess if there's nothing nothing major or if you've got another major nugget you wanted to share uh i'd let you do that but uh, otherwise i'm gonna wrap up by talking a little bit again about that school and and putting that at, at sure. the people's front of, um, front of people's mind. I, I don't have the dates all in front of me off the top of my head. Um, I'm going to be speaking all three days at Husker Harvest Days. That is September 13th through the 15th. That'll be in the livestock area. And I think the time that I'm slotted for is right before lunch. And then we've got the school coming up in Deadwood. The uh, Market Intel blog, which is on Beef Magazine's website every Friday. And, you know, we've been getting a lot of email requests already to do a school sometime in the winter. And so you'll have to pay attention to my my website, MrCattleMaster.com. If you email me and request to be put on our email list, we email those people about an upcoming school before we announce it anywhere. So the people on the email list usually get about a week's notice before a school, but there will be, there will, there will be one sometime in the winter, depending on what my daughter's basketball schedule is going to be. Yeah. So September 25th through the 27th with a ranch tour, either the evening of the 27th or the morning of the 28th, um, in Deadwood, South Dakota, it's a destination location. There was a lot of people that took me up on my offer to come to the uh, to the to the Young Farmers and Ranchers conference that we put on there, and and I don't think Deadwood disappointed any of them. And you'll be honestly coming at a better time of the year, coming at the end of September. You might even get in on some of the fall colors and Spearfish Canyon and some of that. So, uh, really encourage you to to look into that, uh, check out the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 254, workingcows.net slash 254. It'll give you six weeks to uh, make your plans, get get registered, and uh, and and get in on this school that's going to be happening in Deadwood, South Dakota, September 25th through the 27th. Uh, hope to see you all there. Uh, Doug, thanks for your time today. Yeah, Clay, if I could add one thing. Fire away. If- we're planning to come to that Deadwood school, make your room reservations early. Because if you get your rooms reserved early and you mention that you're coming to our school, you get a reduced rate. Got it. Yep. The lodge at Deadwood is, is one of the newer casinos in Deadwood and it's a beautiful facility. Uh, they did a really good job with that. I'm looking forward to being back there. So very good stuff there with Doug. Really appreciate his time. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to sit down with him. Looking forward to uh, the marketing school, as I said, September 25th through the 27th. would encourage you to check out the show notes page for today for links to uh, registration for that marketing school. And uh, coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast, we'll be talking to Mary Jo Ehrman. We're going to talk to her about uh, what you can do to uh, make your set yourself up for success with regard to profitability and, and your numbers and your money and long term uh, investment in the future of your family tree uh, through some of the things that she she shares about and so uh, encourage you to check that out and she's got a she also has a seminar coming up that uh, wanted to make you aware of as well and that will be in Wyoming, an opportunity to just sit down with her over a couple hours and and meet her face-to-face and ask her questions and some of those things. So if you're interested in that, uh, be on the lookout for that. You can find find out uh, more about that upcoming opportunity at farmingwithoutthebank.com. You can go there and check that out, or it'll be in the show notes page for next week's episode as well. 
So look forward to that. And as always, I've been really trying to be diligent about capturing bonus content with every guest. So I think I just released episode 50 of bonus content to Patreon supporters. And so uh, if you're interested in that, um, that value proposition keeps getting better, but you also keep Uh, missing out if you're not in on that. So $10 a month gets you access to the entire back catalog of 50 uh, episodes or um, yeah, or there's other options as well. So check that out at uh, the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 254. And we will see you again real soon with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.